Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shelley Evanevli. I am the current acting deputy director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Together with Susan Daniels, we want to welcome you to our annual special lecture to recognize National Autism Awareness Month. National Autism Awareness Month is a time to gather as a community to recognize the contributions and needs of individuals on the autism spectrum and renew our commitment to provide supports and opportunities to help them succeed. NIMH is committed to supporting, stimulating, and directing research on autism and other mental conditions that will transform our understanding of these conditions and lead to improved diagnoses, interventions, and supports. In addition to supporting research efforts, the NIMH provides leadership and management for the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, or the IACC. This is a federal advisory body that provides advice about autism to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Susan Daniels is the Director of the Office of Autism Research, and her office coordinates and, man coordinates and manages the IACC as well as other cross-agency activities. I want to thank Susan and her OARC staff for organizing today's lecture. And I welcome Susan to the podium to introduce today's speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. On behalf of the Office of Autism Research Coordination, it's my pleasure to also welcome our audience, both here in Lipset Amphitheater and those who are joining us by webcast to today's fifth annual NIMH Special Lecture for Autism Awareness Month. Our guest speakers, New York Times bestselling authors John Donvan and Karen Zucker, will be sharing what they discovered on their journey to learn more about the history of autism and what lessons from the past can teach us about how we should move forward to create a brighter future for people on the autism spectrum and other people with disabilities. John Donovan is a, multi, a multiple Emmy Award winning correspondent for ABC and moderator of the Intelligence Squared US Debates series. He also became interested in autism's impact on families after meeting his wife, who's a physician and whose brother is profoundly affected by autism. Karen Zucker is a Peabody award-winning television news producer with ABC and PBS, where she produced and co-wrote the six-part PBS series, Autism Now. She also is the mother of a son on the autism spectrum. Please join me in welcoming John Donvan and Karen Zucker. Thank you very much. Um, we're both uh, really honored to have been invited by NIMH for this event and to be in front of an audience that we think is probably comprised largely of scientists. Um, Karen and I have been partners together working in television for many years, and so we have a little bit of a shift in our dynamic in that I was always the face on television, and she was the person behind the scenes out of the spotlight. And so um, we not only had to figure out how to write a book together as co-authors, but uh, now that we're at the point of the process where we're going out and talking about the book, um, there are, we've had to have an, an adjustment where I shut up so that she can speak, and, and she gets used to speaking. Um, so it's a, it's a new experience for both of us and, uh, and an exciting one, especially as this is a book that we're, we really put a lot into. We worked on it for many, many years, minimum of seven years, depending on how you calculate it. Um, and Karen's going to talk a little bit about how it is that two television people ended up going into book writing and doing a book about autism. John and I were both working at ABC News. John's still a correspondent for ABC, and I was a producer. And in 1996, my son was diagnosed with autism. And what I didn't know at the time is John had a, uh, his wife, um, brother, was severely autistic. And we just sort of joined forces, no longer just as journalists, but as two people that really wanted to get a message across about autism, because it was really underreported, if reported at all during that time period. And we, we had started to write the book about halfway through. We, we started producing stories around 2000. And in about 2005, 2006, we decided we needed to do something that would be more enduring, that would be a history so we could, move, we could learn from the past and um, move forward to the future. And the first breakthrough we had is we had, um, we had met the first person ever diagnosed with autism. And we had our article published in The Atlantic, 
called the Autism's First Child. And then the rest is, that was in 2010, and six years later, we got these. It's very big, <laughs> it's very big scary big book. Um, and we want to emphasize for anybody who's watching or hasn't seen the book yet, um, that it's actually written to be a very easy read. Um, it's 46 little stories, uh, 46 chapters. And th the book is largely made up of the stories of people who have autism or their family members. It's the story of parents, uh, of activists, of educators, of lawyers, civil rights activists, self-advocates. But there's a significant portion of the book also covers the professions that many of the people here in this room and our audience are part of. And that would be the scientific investigative professions as well, researchers. And Karen and I approached the topic of science and, and research and your professions, I have to say, with a great deal of humility. Um, it's our starting position going in and coming out that you know more about certain aspects of autism than we can ever understand. Um, we look at you as detectives in this field, and, and it really is you know, very much a mystery what it is that we're looking at when we look at autism and try to figure out a response to autism. And we respect that, and we tell that from the point of view of a detective story. That's not to say that over the 70 to 75 years that we cover, we didn't come to some conclusions about times when the researchers maybe went down the wrong direction and made some mistakes and their influence actually caused harm. But overall, um, we took the position when there was, for example, a fad versus science or a myth versus science, we've always taken the position that we want to go where the science goes. So to the degree that we take sides in the controversies, and there are many of them that have come up in autism, we end up wanting to know what the data has shown, or at least the preponderance of the data, the majority of the data. So that really informs our book. But um, in the same way that you are uh, detectives in our eyes, we were journalistic detectives as well. There was a lot that we didn't know when we began because it hadn't been written about before. We had to go into a lot of archives that hadn't really been visited in a very, very long time, if at all, to dig out parts of the story that nobody had paid attention to. And as Karen said, it started with uh, our first really sort of big break and the thing that inspired us was our making contact with the first child named in the literature by Leo Connor in his seminal article in 1943 in which he described autism for the first time and he designated among his 11 children that he described, one of them he called Case One, Donald, last name just the initial T. We didn't know the rest of the last name and it was a great inspiration to us to actually get to know and meet Donald T. But that also took a little bit of detective work, and that started with Karen. It was 2007, and as John just said, we knew that Donald's last name started with a T. We also knew that he grew up in Forest, Mississippi, which was a small town, about 3,500 people. And I did what any journalist would do back in 2007. I opened the phone book and started to call all the T's. And thinking this could take a month or so, um, about a dozen names through, I, I got an answering machine. And the machine picked up and said, hello, happy spring, and have a wonderful fall, and a great December, happy 2007. And I, I have a son with autism. I, I knew that was Donald's right then and there. <laughs> and I called John and I said, we got it. I know this is him. You know, now we, got, now we got to go down there and meet him. And we, we didn't want to just go straight down and knock on his door. He'd never been spoken to in the press before. Um, and so we, we reached out to journalists and to his family. And the really fascinating thing that we learned right away about Donald and this community was how protective they were. They told us, okay, you can come down and you can interview Donald. But if you mess with him, we'll come and get you. And, and they really weren't kidding. They, they threatened us, and we came anyway. And, and you know, some years later, we're, we're, we're all friends. But it was the first taste of how this community had embraced him. And we learned a lot more about that in the years that we went back and forth to Forest. So obviously, we're talking now, Karen's talking now about Donald near the end of his life. He's still alive, by the way. He's 82 and he's doing great. We're going to talk a little bit about that towards the end of our remarks. 
Um, but the story, of course, begins in 1938 when um, Donald's parents, who had some means and some education, were able to get him to Baltimore, where he was seen by Leo Connor at Johns Hopkins. And Leo Connor ultimately, as we said, featured Donald in his 1943 article in which he first described the case in some, Donald's case and 10 others in some detail, and that becoming the seminal article in the story of autism. But we move forward from there then through the next 75 years, and among the more interesting discoveries that we made as journalists um, trying to tell this story was that we, we started out assuming that when people talked about autism, they all meant the word the same way, and that they were all talking about the same thing. And I'll say, frankly, we struggled for the first couple of years of our research when we were, well, are we looking at what, this person says autism means this, and it has this kind of response, and this person means that, and it refers to this population, no, that population, no, it's a larger group, it's a smaller group. We were trying to figure out how are we going to tell this story about this about this syndrome, condition, call it what you will, that, that seems to us, is, is, we're being flooded with different impressions of what it means and what it's about, until we finally kind of had the light bulb go off, saying, well, part of our story needs to be to say out loud and explicitly that the actual definition of autism has always been a little bit of a mess and a little bit confusing and never si settled down specifically anywhere, and to explore that idea and to explore that thought and try to think through its implications. And the first breakthrough for that was we, we like firsts as journalists, so we had the first child diagnosed by Leo Connor. We wanted to look at what was the first study done on the so-called prevalence rate of autism. What's the rate of autism? Um, what was the first epidemiology? And it was actually published 50 years ago next month by a researcher in London named Victor Lauder. And we went back and looked very, very closely at what Victor Lauder actually did back in 1965 and 1966 when he undertook this first study to find out how much, their autism, how much autism there was in the world. And I interviewed his, he's, he's passed away, but I interviewed his wife who now lives in Canada. Um, and I, inter I, I interviewed people who knew him. Um, I, tracked down the notes to his memorial service where people remembered him. And I read, most importantly, his own writings that he published in 1966. And what was so fascinating was that when Victor Lauder undertook the very first prevalence study of autism, he himself was struggling with trying to figure out, when he went out to count autism in a specific county in the United Kingdom, he had a very hard time figuring out just who am I counting? And who am I not supposed to count? And from here and there, Karen and I are going to read a little bit from the book. Victor Lauder came from South Africa. He was, uh, uh, by, he, he'd started university late in his late 20s due to a childhood illness, which kept him home for much of his life. And um, he graduated in his early 30s from the University of Cape Town and ended up in London with this assignment to undertake this study on behalf of the council of Middlesex County, which doesn't exist as an entity anymore. But he, set, he, he used basic epidemiology. He sent out surveys to a number of schools. He decided to look at three birth years, 1953, 54, 55, that he knew represented a population of 78,000 children. He sent out questionnaires to all of the schools, all of the mental hospitals, um, all of the residential, residential communities where children might live who might have been identified as what we would take today call intellectually disabled. And, in trying to figure out what he was going to ask in these questionnaires as markers, he was really stymied. So this is what we wrote. Lauder was supposed to count kids with autism, but the question of whom to count, the matter of deciding whether a given individual had autism, was a mess of diagnostic confusion. When he turned to the medical literature to put together a simple list of defining symptoms for his survey, he discovered a tangle of competing syndromes, each with its own name, laying claim to the same traits that Leo Connor had described years earlier as being autism. In addition to Connor's quote unquote infantile autism, there was also Loretta Bender's childhood schizophrenia, 
Beata Rank's atypical child, Margaret Mahler's symbiotic psychosis, and a long list of other contenders, including schizophrenic psychosis of childhood, dementia precocemia, dementia infantilis, prepuber prepubertal schizophrenia, pseudopsychopathic schizophrenia, infantile psychosis, and latent schizophrenia. These terms were all being used interchangeably to describe children showing the same sorts of behaviors. As the British child psychiatrist Michael Rudder wrote in this period, it is by no means clear that all of these authors are talking about the same condition. Any lay observer might think that autism was autism simply and objectively and always, but that was not the case and never would be. So how did Lauder decide who he was going to count? This guy who had a BA, who was working on his dissertation. He made up his own list. He made it up as best he could. He used some of the characteristics, relied a lot on Leo Connor. He relied a lot on another uh, list of criteria by uh, a British psychiatrist named Mildred Creek. These were known as Creek's Nine Points. And he sort of mushed them together, and he checked in with his thesis advisors. And he sent out in a questionnaire a list of specific items, some of which you may recognize as uh, um, making little eye contact, uh, obsessive interest in objects. But he had about 27 items on the list. And he gets back from the survey um, enough indications so that he thinks he has about 666 possible cases of autism among these 78,000 children. And then he... Um, he looks at, with his advisors, he goes over these returns and he narrows the list down more and more and more till the point finally comes where he has approximately 66 children. And what Lauder then did was he went in person with his wife over many, many months. They drove around and walked around and took trains. They wanted to see each of these people themselves so that they could eyeball it and, and make their own assessment. And in the, in the end, he came up with this list of 66 people and he ranked them from one to, to position one to position 66, depending on the um, severity of their, of, their, uh, of their presentation of, tra of traits. And he ultimately s made a very, very unusual choice, or strange choice, I would say. After position number 35, he drew a line. And his explanation for where he drew the line was, it's where it thought it should be drawn. And it's not clear who thought it should be drawn, whether he thought it should be drawn, or whether his thesis advisors thought it should be drawn there. But he drew it at that point, and he said at that point that the children from positions 1 to 35 had autism, and the children below the list did not have autism. So that gave him a yield of 35 kids out of 78,000, or 4.5 out of 10,000, or that's 1 in 2,500. As you probably know, you've probably heard again and again and again, people will say, well, 1 in 2,500, that's what the rate of autism used to be. It used to be 1 in 2,500. It was startling for us to find out that 1 in 2,500 isn't what the autism rate used to be. We don't really think we know what the autism rate used to be. What we think we discovered is what, that 1 in 2,500 is what Victor Lauder was able to come up with as best as he could in a very confused situation, making his own choices as, a, as an undergraduate student, as, 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 a, as a graduate student. Um, and the, 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 the upshot to us is that we go forward after that research in looking at all prevalent studies, all claims about autism, recognizing the fact that from the very, very beginning, we actually don't all agree on what it is that we're talking about. We're not sure what we mean even by autism. We can come up with criteria, but the criteria change again and again and again. And we think it's one of the reasons that it's very, very risky to be dogmatic about making any kind of assertion about autism. It's just one of the reasons. And Lauder said a very, very interesting thing in the last paragraph of his study in 1966 in the whole concept of undertaking prevalence studies. True, pre true prevalence, he wrote, may not be a useful concept in the case of a syndrome so poorly defined. So he said that 50 years ago. 50 years later. 50 years later. Still have the same problem. We still have different definitions for autism through the decades. 
We continually change the DSM, and it is so difficult to really get a true prevalence because every time we count, we're counting something different. We're never counting the same thing. It's like counting apples and oranges. Um, Dr. Ed Ritvo, in 1982, between 1982 and 1986, um, studied all the people he could get together that he thought met, met the requirements for the list in the DSM from 1980 for what constituted... In, in the state of Utah. In the state of Utah, what constituted autism. And he came up with a number, you know, 379. And then out of that number, he went through the DSM checklist and decided 241 of them had autism. 25 years later, a group of researchers go to Dr. Ritko and say, can we use your research? We want to go back and visit those same people and see what the prevalence is. And um, he, had, he had kept very good records. So they went back and they visited all of the 379 people. They, they were from ages 3 to 25. And now it's 25 years later. And they come back, and now they're using the DSM from... 2000. And astonishingly, or maybe not astonishingly, 64 more people now have autism. Well, nothing changed. These are all the same people. But the defini definition of autism changed. And that's what we keep doing. And it's part of what we, we feel, and it's part of what we report in our book, has made it so hard for research and to figure out awareness and prevalence. because. Everything is so squishy, almost. Which is not to say that in our book we take a dogmatic position that there has not been some sort of underlying increase in autism. We, our book is, is not dogmatic about very much. Um, what we do is we explore the pros and cons and the arguments for and against. But we come away from the question that everyone asks us at every event, is there an autism epidemic? with the conclusion that we don't think we really know if there's an autism epidemic, and we don't know if there's not an autism epidemic. We also make the point that in terms of wanting to provide services for individuals who need help, it shouldn't matter whether that decision is affected by the presence or existence of an autism epidemic or not, that that's a standalone question. Of course, the two often get confused with one another. But it's also, it's also our point that as you probably know if you're in the field, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, a lot of people arguing with each other in the autism world. The, the, the community's great undoing in some ways is its inner tensions and contentiousness. Um, and it's unfortunate, uh, but it's there and it's a reality. And we've asked at every interview that we did with almost everybody over the years, we interviewed more than 200 people, we kept asking the question, why is there so much inner dissension in the autism community? And we heard a lot of different theories about it. But the one theory that we sort of developed for ourselves is that the fact that the definition itself is, is so all over the place, the fact that we really don't know what we're, what we're describing for, with certainty when we describe uh, a set of behaviors whose, whose criteria change over time, who are always uh, observed by an observer who cannot at some level help but being subjective, with definitions that change through time, where there are no biomarkers, there are no cheek, cheek swaps, that this has resulted in a concept that allows almost anybody to say almost anything about it, about autism at any time. And at one point or another, somebody probably will say almost everything or anything about it. And therefore, autism has been described as essentially behavioral in nature, biomedical in nature, psychogenic in nature, with with, it's the reason we think that there, it's one of the reasons we think that there's been so much opportunity for con artists and also well-meaning people to propose um, treatments that range from pills and diets to wrapping in wet towels to, in other, some parts of the world, exorcism to, uh, in this country, a range from behavioral therapies to biomedical therapies to, uh, to just to out and out right acceptance of the individual as he or she is. That, that all of this dissension and all of this confusion and all of this argumentation results from the fact that we still aren't really agreeing on what it is when we say that we know what autism is and that we're not all using the word in the same way even though the, that we think we do. And the, the sort of the, the, the best example and sort of the most painful one that we discover in the history, and I'm sure some of you know this, is that there was a period in time when psychoanalysis held sway 
in the 1940s, 1950s, well into the 1960s. And psychiatry more or less felt that it had figured out what caused autism. And that answer was that mothers' failure to love their children adequately at birth was what caused autism. And th there was no science behind this assertion. Um, it, was, uh, it was just part of the zeitgeist at the time that mothers were blamed for lots of things in psychiatry. And this idea took hold um, uh, and was pr particularly promulgated by Bruno Bettelheim at the University of Chicago. But he wasn't alone by any means. There were many, many others. And it was just the, th the fact that in the 1960s, if a woman of means presented herself to a psychiatrist with a child who was autistic for diagnosis, and the child was diagnosed with autism, and the mother said, well, what am I supposed to do? The, the advice was two, twofold. One is, put your child away in an institution. Sometimes they literally said, put your child away in an institution and forget about that child and concentrate on the rest of your kids. And the other part was, well, I want to do something for my child. What can I do? What's the treatment? And the mother would be told, the treatment is for you, mother, to go immediately into intensive psychoanalysis so that you can discover what it is that caused you to reject your child and when was the moment that you rejected your child. And if you can recreate that moment, have that discovery, perhaps by having that aha moment about that past interaction with your child, you can start to do something to reverse it. And many, many women went through this. And the reason I say the memes again is because they had to have the money to pay the psychoanalysts. And Karen tracked down, these women are now in their 80s, in some cases in their 90s, tracked down women from this generation. And, and the stories that, you, that we tell in the book from this generation are really painful. Uh, I would spend hours with them. And it wouldn't be until the, the last hour there was one woman, Rita Tepper. She was a social worker. And she had studied psychology. So she knew what the theory was. And when she learned that her son had autism, she knew, well, I, I caused it. it. I didn't love my child enough. And the, the sense that a parent who already is, is struggling to care for their child with autism feels this guilt on top of it, it was so painful to these mothers. But on the other side, there was also, well, if I can figure it out, if it's my fault, maybe I can fix it. So Rita told me the story, and this is, this is about three hours into the conversation, and it's the first time she ever told the story, and she's crying, and she said, you know, I remember being in the psychologist's office, and I was trying to think, you know, what was it that I did when I first laid eyes on my child? How did I do this? And she, all of a sudden, she thought back in time that when he was first born, she, she had this hope for this pink, cuddly, snuggly baby. And what she saw was this little boy who was jaundiced. And he was yellow. And he was pretty scrawny. And his hair was standing up. And he had blonde hair. And she thought, she, three years later, she finally has figured it out. You know, he looked like a chicken. That was my first thought when I saw him, that he looked like a chicken. And now she knows, this is, uh, this is how I caused my son's autism, because I thought he looked like a chicken, and he was a chicken, and this is my fault. And this went on for decades and decades, and we, we lost years of research and treatment for children because we were treating the mothers, and we were blaming the mothers. And it was a very dark time in our history, because not only did we, not, did we accuse mothers of not loving their children enough, but we didn't help the children. So... As Karen just said, Leo Connor writes in 1943. Rita Tepper's story took place in 1964. 21 years have gone by. Your field is not interested in autism, all of you who are involved in the biomedical side. Genetics, not interested in autism. In fact, um, genetics was, was shunned uh, in, in the United States uh, by psychiatry and by psychology as, a, as an explanation for anything that was happening with the brain because it had been so stained by the Nazi period. There was a, a Swedish psychologist came over to a conference here on autism and he wanted to bring up the discussion of whether there was possibly a genetic component and he stood up to speak and he was shouted down for raising the possibility that there was a genetic component to autism. And he wrote afterwards that he felt like he had, he had spoken some sort of profanity. And in the eyes of the community, the scientific community at the time, he had, because it's still 
evoked that Nazi period. So now we go forward another dozen years or so into the mid-1970s, and for the first time, science begins, science undertakes an important study that relates to the genetics of autism. And it took place, again, as much of the breakthrough science does in our story, uh, and breakthrough thinking about autism took place in the United Kingdom. Sir Michael Rudder, today Sir Michael Rudder, uh, Michael Rudder, just Mike, just Mike then, um, was a psychiatrist at the Maudsley Hospital and the Institute of Psychiatry in uh, South London. And he got a hold of a list of about nine or 10 twin sets of children who were twins who lived in the United Kingdom where one or the other member, uh, pair of the twins had autism. And he, he got this because there was another doctor who was just a sort of general practitioner who was interested in autism. And he had been over the years collecting lists of twins where one or the other or both had autism. And he had passed away. This doctor, Clark, had passed away in the early 1970s. And his wife was going through his stuff, his papers, and clearing out his desk. And she came across this list of twins. And she looked it over, and she recognized that maybe it had some value. So she started asking around, what can I do with this list of papers, this list of twins? And ultimately, it reached Michael Rudder. And Rudder decided that right here could be the basis for an important look at the genetics of autism, because we all know the magical values of twins in, in genetic studies. And what he wanted to do, though, was to be comprehensive. He decided that he wanted to track down every twin set in the United Kingdom, not counting Ireland and Northern Ireland, but Scotland, Wales, and England. He wanted to, he wanted to find them all. And um, he couldn't do it on his own. So he hired an American, uh, somebody who had just graduated from Cornell Medical School, a woman named Susan Falstein, who, if you are up on autism now, you know that she's now a major figure in uh, in the autism story. Um, but at this point, she was an unknown, and she was looking for an interesting summer project. And so through connections, she found out that Michael Rudder was looking for somebody to find, to track down all of the twins in the United Kingdom. So he hired her, and she moves her family over to, to London. She has small children at this point. And together, they wrote letters to every pediatrician in the country, every mental institution, every mental hospital, every special education school, asking for lists of all of the twins in, uh, in uh, the United Kingdom who had autism in one or the other or both twins. And they got back uh, quite a, a list, about 21 sets. And um, again, Rudder, like Victor Lauder, uh, 10 years earlier, considered it highly important to eyeball these people, to go see them himself, not just trust the records because they would be making the determination. So he gave it the assignment to Susan Folstein, who, who knew nothing about getting around in England, she told us, and she didn't even know how to, she once got stuck on a train, she didn't know how to open the train door at the stop, and the train went by, and if you've lived in England, that's probably not true anymore, but I used to, to open the train door in England, you have to reach outside through the window and open the door handle from the outside. So she didn't know that. So she missed a lot of stops on her first trip somewhere way up north. But um, we're going to read again from, from the book a little bit of the story that Susan Falstein tells about her detective work because it was so impressive. So she would go out two or three times a week for over a year and visit all these families. Um, thus, in the summer of 1974, Falstein found herself in the far north of England, slushing through a soggy field toward a small encampment of mobile homes, where she spotted a mother bending down to help a naked toddler urinate in the mud. The woman's hair was waist length and loose, the same orange red as the child's. There was no phone service out there or electricity or running water. Still, the woman appeared not at all surprised to have an American suddenly showing up at her trailer. Some weeks earlier, a letter had arrived, and the woman, who could not read, had walked, had walked it into town to have the doctor, who looked after her kids, read it to her. It was from Falstein, explaining her research interest in the woman's twin boys. For most of 1974, and into the late spring of 1975, Falstein was on the road roughly two days out of every week, working through Rudder's list of twins, crisscrossing the United Kingdom, taking tea with every social class. Autism was in all, their, all these places. 
The, that red mane mother belonged to a social tribe referred to usually unkindly as gypsies. Falstein met other tribes, spending an afternoon in the midst of glorious gardens at the country mansion of a celebrity actri actress married to a famous musician, who were the parents of twins. On yet another day, she dined in the home of a retired general grandfather, the children she'd come to see, eating bad food from silver plates. So after more than a year of this, these kinds of firsthand experiences, she and Rudder sit down with all of their data and they were pretty stunned by what they found. In the end, they found a total of 21 sets of twins. 11 were identical twins, 10 were fraternal twins. There was autism in every set, sometimes just one child, sometimes both children. And the finding that they announced at a conference in Switzerland in 1976 was considered startling at the time. Um, there were four pairings out of the 21, there were four pairings where both twins had autism. All four of those twins were identical twins. Among the fraternal twins, there were no pairings where both children had autism. And Folstein and Rudder both talked with us about that day. Folstein made the announcement. Rudder's a very generous colleague, and he let her have the moment. He sat in the audience and put her up on the stage and she told me she spent up she was upstairs in her hotel room pacing back and forth practicing this thing in the mirror she'd never really had a moment like this before and she makes this announcement about the four identical twin pairs and the fraternal twins having no matches across both sets and i i think you know you have to you have to be an academic to find this an exciting moment. But she found it an exciting moment because all of her colleagues exploded into applause at this moment, recognizing that what they had just done was make a very, very profound mark in favor of the argument that autism had a genetic component. And she came off the stage, and this very young, unknown researcher was mobbed by some of the big names in the field at the time. One of them said, you've got to publish in Nature right away. She published, she and Rudder published in Nature right away, and then they published the fuller material the following year in 1977. So we, we see this as sort of, you know, there, there, you can be arbitrary about this, but we see this as a very important turning point in sort of the beginning, the beginning of the beginning of more of a biomedical look at, um, at the study of autism. And so what happened, however, was that it still was the case that science, the, the biomedical sciences remained, despite this finding, rather uninterested still in autism. Uh, it, it only fell to the psychologists to take an interest in autism. And that work was being done primarily through behavioral, the development of behavioral treatments, what everybody now knows as ABA. It's quite a long section in our book, but we will refer you to the book for that. Um, we, we were startled to discover that in its very early days, um, the early experiments on ABA relied a great, a great deal more than you would ever imagine today on the use of punishment and electric shock on children. Um, Ivar Lovas, who did the first studies and published them in 1964 and literally called them the punishment studies, um, um, borrowed uh, for uh, three children from Camarillo State Hospital in, uh, in, uh, outside of Los Angeles. And he, these children were severely, severely, severely self-injurious, such that their lives, day in and day out, were spent in restraints. Uh, one boy couldn't walk anymore because he had a foreshortened Achilles heel because of the restraints. He had to be propped up in a chair. That's, this is how severely impacted these children were. In Lovas's early experiments, he actually went to a, a mail-order catalog for farming equipment, and he got an electric cattle prod. Um, he wanted a cattle prod because it, it dealt a a measured shock for a measured period of time. It could be precise. And he used the cattle prod to suppress their self-injurious behavior, and he actually succeeded it for a time in doing so. In very short order, and again, there's much more detail about this in the book. Over the years, he, underwent, he, under, he came, under, came under severe criticism for the use of these aversive techniques and ultimately uh, amended his method and relied much more on positive techniques to the point where in the 1990s, um, families became desperate for access to ABA and funds from their school districts to pay for ABA. And we went through yet another one of the great contentious rounds of the story of autism, parents suing their school districts to have access to this for funding to uh, get provision for this, this therapy called ABA, which has now moved a very, very, very long way 
from the basics of what Ivar Lovis was doing, and it's much more positive, much more naturalistic, and it's filtered into many, many other kinds of therapies now that have different names and would in no way really resemble what Lovas was up to. But all of this was on the psychology side. There was still nothing happening on the biomedical side, almost nothing happening. And then Karen's <laughs> going to take that. It started again with parents. But very, very little had been done. There, there was a bit of biomedical research. And what's interesting is just like the, the rest of the history that you can read in our book, it was parents who really changed things, parents who helped close down the institutions. It was parents who op you know, fought to have schools open so their children could be admitted. Children with autism were barred from school if the school district didn't want to take them before the 70s. Well, the, there's, there were two parents that actually changed the face of scientific research in terms of autism. And that the fact that all of you are sitting here today, um, some of it has a lot to do with the fact that um, CAN, which is called Cure Autism Now, ran by um, uh, Portia Iveson and John Shestack, started a program on the West Coast. We called it the Hollywood Couple. And then on the East Coast, Karen London and Eric London started a organization called NAF. And almost simultaneously, it was the first time that anybody had begun organizations to raise money for biomedical research. And Eric London, who was a psychiatrist, back in 1993, he was at a neuroscience conference. And uh, a friend of his came back with the binders. And he and his wife and uh, this, the, this friend, the Dr. The binders, Aaron, that, that, the binders that, that had all of the, all of the abstracts from 1993 neuroscience. Um, the Society of Neuroscience. The Society of Neuroscience. And, and they decided to look through and see who was studying autism. And there were 11,000 abstracts. And they saw the word autism come up 11 times out of 11,000 abstracts. And, and they just couldn't believe it. And none of them were of studies. And that was sort of the catalyst for the Londons to say. We, we should point out the what the, 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 11, 000, the 11 times that autism was mentioned, it was mentioned in passing. None of the studies, as Karen said, were about autism. They were just references like, and unlike as in autism, or similar to autism, but the studies were all about something else. And so the Londons decided, um, it's, it's a much longer story than this, but the Londons, Londons decided they needed to start an organization, and they needed to raise money. And they created a Ivy League scientific advisory committee. And they quickly were able to actually raise money. And then, but then they had to encourage scientists and researchers to come into the field and where, there, where there are almost none. Um, and so Eric London went back to the Society of Neuroscience annual event. And this time, he had grant money in his pocket. And he went and he talked to scientists who were trying to get funding for their ideas and their research. And he would stop and talk to somebody who he thought had, you know, you could connect the sensory issues or the brain waves, all different kinds of things that were going on in neuroscience. He would stop and talk to people and say, you know, you could really connect this to autism. If you focused, if you focused your ideas on autism, you could make that happen. And they would sort of look at him like autism is sort of a dead end. Why, why would you do autism? And then he said, but you know, we're NAR, National Alliance for Autism Research, and we're giving out grants. And so all of a sudden, the eyes lit up, and people started to apply for grants to NAR. And a field started to grow. And then those people who had gotten the grants and started the projects then reached out to the NIH and were able to get larger fundings. And so much of what exists today is because these two families started these scientific organizations. On the, on the West Coast, John and Portia, who were convinced that they could cure autism now, that was their, that was their goal, that, that's what they called the or organization, um, started the first, um, they started AGREE, the Autism um, Genetic Research Exchange, which all of you, you know, or many of you may know about, and how, how you research DNA for people with autism. Um, the, NAR created the first brain bank. 
So these, these two parents, these two families, really are the basis of why there is any scientific research done in autism in this country today. So finally, before we take questions, one short dark story we discovered and then a very bright story. We didn't expect to find this, but there's a, there's a narrative out there about Hans Asperger that he was a, um, he, and Hans Asperger, if you don't know, was a pediatrician working in Vienna during the Nazi period who focused on children and wrote about them in, uh, first in 1938 and again in 1944. He used the word autistic to describe them. Um, and these, these were children who, who today would have been described as having Asperger's syndrome. They were um, socially challenged, but they were, um, in most cases, highly intelligent, highly verbal. Um, and a, a story has grown up over the years that Asperger was a sort of secret hero. While working under the Nazis, he was protecting these vulnerable children from the Nazis themselves who would be inclined to murder children who were disabled at a certain point. And to be honest, we also wrote that story. Um, it's in the first draft of our book. And we discovered, we published last year, two months ago in January. It was only in the early winter of March of 2014, two years ago, that we stumbled across a different piece of the story about Asperger. And after going back and forth a lot, we decided to include it in our book, and it's proven controversial but it was something that we didn't feel could be hidden. And it was the discovery made by an Austrian historian, a young historian named uh, Herwigcheck, whose field is the behavior of Nazi-era medical people in Austria, who discovered that Asperger, who was often consulted by parents with severely disabled children, in 1941, signed a piece of paper that said about a little girl named Herta, who was two years old, that she should be immediately sent to a place called the Spiegelgrund. And the Spiegelgrund was the facility where the Nazis murdered children who were disabled. Um, they didn't murder all of them, but they made a decision there. Few left, hundreds died there. This little girl died there. And the notion that this, that Asperger was some sort of hero who was standing up to the Nazis completely fell apart for us when we saw him say, a permanent placement in the Spiegelgrund is recommended in the case of Hertha Schreiber. Any Austrian who hears about this and is aware of the Spiegelgrund would see this as her death warrant. In fact, she went in there in July of 1941 and she was murdered two months later, the day after she turned three. And we included this in our book because we we can't hide it. We don't think it should be hidden. We're disturbed by attempts to try to explain it away. Uh, we don't know the context, of course, the daily context in any great detail about uh, under which Asperger was working. We're sure it wasn't great. But our feeling is that if you're going to call somebody a hero, heroism comes in moments like this when you can, you can twist the words and save that child. And that didn't happen. So we included it in the book. We don't make any other judgments about Asperger. We just felt that that fact needed to be included. We do not demonize him. He was not a member of the Nazi party. That's pretty much well established. But he did a fair amount of accommodation to the times. Again, we didn't live in that world. We don't know what he was up against. We just feel that we know what a hero is, and that wasn't heroism. So we included it in the book. And that's the dark moment in our book. The brighter moment comes at the end of our book. We said we're going to get back to Donald Triplett. Donald Triplett is 82 years old, and Karen's going to take two minutes to tell us what his life is like now. Donald has a remarkable story, and it's not the, it's not the story of every child diagnosed with autism. In <coughs> fact, it's, you know, it's, it's a rare story, because Donald, who is case number one, really was aut autistic. He had all the qualities of what, what we describe as autism today. But through his life, and, and we really think this is so much because of the support of the community that he grew up in, he had this mother who's, who would never give up on him. They had, during, during his life, we sent people to institutions. And his mother did that. But a year after sending him there, she took him back and said, no, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, I gave up too early. I have to fight to give this young man a life. And that's what she did. And he, I just lost my train of thought. Well, 
he's turned out spectacularly well. She taught him how to drive at 27. He travels all over the world. And this man has autism. I, I'm, this is not Asperger's. This is, this, this is somebody who really still has so many of the characteristics of autism, but he's learned how to live a life independently. He plays golf every day. Now, a lot of his success is, you know, his family was very wealthy. They own the local bank, and so that made a huge difference. But, but we really believe that it was the embrace of the community and that they all decided from when he was a little boy that they were going to accept him as part of who they were. Do, do we have time to tell one of the stories when he was younger? I think we don't. Okay. Unless, unless somebody asks us a question, <laughs> tell us a story about Donald when he was younger. But we should go to questions now. But you want to, what we want to say about Donald's story, and the reason we put it at the end of our book, whatever happened in Forest, Mississippi, Donald grew to his full potential. We know that community accepted him. They accepted him so much that when we two Yankees went down there, they threatened us with some very deep Mississippi accents. And they meant it. Don't hurt this guy. He's one of us. And we think that's gone a long, that goes a long way to explaining Donald's great outcome in life. And we would like to say that if we could bottle whatever society did around Donald in this little town of Forest, Mississippi, and ship it out to the rest of the world, that would be a great thing for everybody who's connected to this story. Because we don't, you don't need any money. You don't need, you don't need treatment. This is just, we can do this as a society. We can make a difference in everyone's life who has autism just by standing up and standing behind them. If you're, if you're excerpted saying, we don't need any money. OK, you. I didn't mean to say that. I, I, I totally take that back. What I meant to say was Compassion there are things doesn't cost that we can do for free yes. that are worth, you, you can't put a price tag on. So we'll take some questions now. I just want to say, my name is Carol Van Ryzen. I'm a um, nurse practitioner here at NIH, and I um, have read your book cover to cover, and it is the shortest 700-page book I've ever read in my life. It's fantastic. And if you're intimidated by the book size, I had it an e electronic version, and it was very easy to hold. Um, <laughs> let me just, I just want to make a little comment about the book, and one of the things that I found, um, you talk about community over and over again, mm -hmm. and I think what's so fascinating is that we're living in a time right now where people are um, not working in communities very well, I don't think. Um, it's, we're kind of into like identifying haves and have nots and others as like bad and good. And, and I just, I love the stories about community that you tell in the book. And one of my favorites is the one about the being on the bus, the kid with autism who's learning. That's so my favorite. Can you tell that? Um, <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you book. tell it because oh, I feel right, like, right, okay. right. because okay. I feel like that's. Um, we will tell that story yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a scene that actually takes place. Um, happened in 2006 in Caldwell, New Jersey on a public bus. He was traveling across town and there was a young man sitting in the front seat. His name was Nicholas. By himself, he has autism. Um, he's not verbal. He's quite severely affected. In fact, he'd been going, undergoing a lot of teaching about how to use a public transportation system. He had a teacher sitting way in the back of the bus um, keeping an eye on things. And suddenly, um, Nicholas starts making some sounds and he starts rocking quite visibly in his seat, and he starts flipping his fingers in front of his face. And the two guys sitting behind him get very, very agitated at Nicholas's behaviors for this. And they lean into him, and they start to harass him. And they say, hey, man, what's your problem? What, they cut it out anyway. And all of a sudden, this other passenger on the bus jumps up and says, hey, what's your problem? He's got autism. Why don't you back off? And all of a sudden, the whole bus rose behind both this passenger and this young man with autism. And the man who was giving him a hard time, the two guys that were giving him a hard time, the bullies, no one wanted them on the bus. And to us, the bus is so symbolic of a community. Right there at that moment, in that time, the bus symbolized everything that you'd wish for for somebody who has autism. That people will have their backs. That I want, I want my kid to be on a bus and someone to stand up behind there and have his back, and anyone else. And we, we wrote the book, even though it's got a direct appeal, obviously, to people who are already connected to autism. We wrote the book to be, as you put, a very fast and good read to, so that it finds an audience outside the autism world, so that everybody else out there recognizes that they are the passengers on the bus who can make life for the young man welcoming, 
or harrowing. And so we think if people read our book who don't know anything about autism, they will recognize the part that all of us as members of society have in impacting the lives of people who do have autism and will want to be the stand-up people on the bus. Hi, I wasn't going to comment, but I see there's no other question, so I will. Uh, I was on the committee that wrote the DSM-5 uh, criteria for autism and have been working with autistic children and families for 40 years. Uh, the criteria aren't as dismal as you might imply. Uh, you know, we've done, we did field trials uh, and we've looked afterwards at the, the criteria in DSM-4 and 5 to make sure that no one lost services and there's no evidence they really have. And people who had their diagnosis before DSM-5 keep the diagnosis, but those going forth will use these criteria. Uh, we spent uh, five years working on them. I don't know if Sue Sweeto's here, but she was chair of the committee. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, as best we can do now, the criteria uh, are uh, reliable. Uh, the dilemma, of course, is that uh, when Connor first described these cases, he focused on their similarities. There were five areas he focused on uh, and eventually winnowed them down to two, autistic aloneness and preservation of sameness. Essentially, in DSM-5, we've moved back to two, uh, and we're actually describing those two features in a somewhat different way in terms of social engagement and repetitive behaviors. But in a way, I like Connors the best because he always focused on the perspective for the child uh, who was alone and perplexed. And many autistic young people have told me they don't know how to make sense of other people's social emotions. Uh, is it telepathy? How do you know how another person feels? This was very poignant with Donald's mother uh, in the 1971 follow-up uh, when she said, I still don't know how my son feels. So I think that it's really very important to keep in mind that we need to move forward with the research. The term autism spectrum was used by Lorna Wing to actually focus on the spectrum to show the differences in outcomes. And what Connor's, Connor's follow-up paper showed in, in, um, in, uh, in the early 70s is that his first paper focused on the, uh, on the similarities. His second paper focused on the, dis on the differences. And those like Donald and another person in the group in particular had very reasonably good outcomes considering uh, the deficits they had. Others, many of whom had gone into institutions, didn't do so well. So we're still working on this, but we have a much more reliable criteria, and they're getting better because now we add specifiers. And so now this is in a way a transition to call it autism spectrum because we're looking next at how we can find within that spectrum identifiable conditions. And one of those focuses is on the genetics and looking at the broader autism phenotype and looking at families where family members have autistic features and to try to essentially hone in on looking at those genetics. Joe Piven is done, doing much of the research in that area. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention though is about Asperger. When I read your book, I couldn't believe it. <clears throat> there were no references. Uh, it, it was a book that cited uh, Czech, but uh, there was no reference in the bibliography other than a paper he intended to publish, which he still hasn't published. So I contacted the chair of psychiatry at the University of Vienna, who I know, and he put me in touch with Czech. And I sent Czech th that chapter of your book, and I asked him if he could verify everything that was there. And he wrote back, he said he could, and that I could use that as a personal communication. He also pointed out, as you've written in your book, uh, that there was another instance where Asperger um, was on a commission with seven others that, that evaluated 220 mm -hmm. children, and 35 of those were sent to Spiegelgrund and were killed. And Czech has published this uh, because it was, it was bad enough that children were killed and they preserved their brains, but research continued to go on for another 30 years after the war on the brains of children who'd been killed yeah. uh, in Spiegelgrund. Do you, uh, do you mind if I... I yeah, let me just stop there, but I, okay. I just wanted to, to highlight the importance both of the definition and on yeah. uh, the importance of the Asperger part. Fair points on both. Um, uh, on the question of uh, Hervik Cech not having published, um, 
that of course concerned us as well. So what we did was we went to Vienna and said, take us to the archives and show us the signature, show us the letters. So we, we saw it with our we own saw eyes. When you're, you're, academics need to have other people write it so that you can cite it. <laughs> Journalists have to go see it with their eyes to be convinced. <laughs> we were convinced and we were shocked by it. Hi, I hope uh, we have time for at least one more question. Sure. Um, my question, I haven't read the book, but I wanted to know um, if you- I just you wanted to mention, just so you know, um, if you're interested, immediately afterwards, we're gonna be in the bookstore, um, and we'll, we can autograph books for anybody who wants to pick one up. We'll go straight there. Okay, um, but in working on producing this book, how many autistic people did you interview and ask about their conditions and their ways of living? Probably, well, Karen and I, because of our covering autism since 2000, um, we, we, we met, spoke to, are related to dozens, we're not related to dozens, that's the wrong way to phrase it, through, through relations as well, we had, we had interactions with dozens of uh, and dozens. People, people with autism, going to schools over the years, friends we have, spent so much time with Donald himself, People like Alex Plank, John Robeson, Michael John Carley, um, and then endless accounts of, of people. Temple Grandin's another. So many, many. So these would be direct interviews with autistic people? Definitely. Yes. Yeah, okay. many. Like uh, s scores, I would say. Okay, good. Thank you. Sure. Although, the history. We, we also, well, I just want to say yeah. we, we also like to count the people who can't be interviewed. Um, and, and in our voice, in our book, we really wanted to give voice to the, we wanted to give a place to the stories of people who can't be interviewed because they're ignored too often by the media. Their stories are not told, their situations are, are not inspiring necessarily or happy. Their needs are huge. My brother-in-law is an example of that. Um, and we, so we tell the story of people like a young man he was a young man named Archie Casto, who was put into a mental institution in 1919 when he was five years old, and he didn't get out until 1991. He's dead now, we didn't get to meet him, but we were able to unearth his story and discover what a horrible life he had until his sister, as an old lady, got him out when they were both old people and he got nine years of freedom. He couldn't speak. So we don't have an interview with Archie, but we tell his story. And the, we're a little bit concerned nowadays we think it's a great thing that the ability of people with autism to speak for themselves is happening. That's a fantastic thing. But we think sometimes that that leads to a pushing to the shadow of those who can't speak for themselves. And we made a very, very strong effort in our book to also tell their stories. Donald, Donald can speak, and so he's, he was a very informative character for us. Um, and he's not, when we say he can speak, he's not, He's not very reflective on the experience of having autism. He, he, he's, you can't really have that conversation with him. You know, we, we saw him recently. Um, Karen and I were both in New York City, and Donald took one of his trips to New York City. He wanted to see a Broadway show. And he contacted us to get together for coffee, because we're really friends now. He likes hanging out with us. You know, he gives numbers to everybody he's ever met in the world, and he gave us numbers back in 2007. We're very honored to have numbers assigned by Donald Karen. I'm 549. I'm, I'm 550. But he did this with, you know, his classes when he was in elementary school. But and you, he remembers everyone that he numbered today, and they all remember their numbers as older citizens. So if you say to Donald, though, how was your trip to New York, which we did, his answer will be, it was fine. I took flight number 46, there were 36 people on board and it landed at 11.02. And then he'll stop talking. He won't, so Donald was not, Donald, but Donald's, our sense of Donald's place in his autism was through observation and really close sensitive listening to him as opposed to him expounding upon it as you know, some people with, with, who have the autism label can do, but so many can't. Our book was also there to tell their story as well. I think we're right. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be in front of this yes, audience. Thank, thank you so much.